Hello everybody and welcome to what's going to be a somewhat unusual video, even by my own standards. I wasn't actually sure whether I was going to make this or not, but I figured on balance I probably would, and hopefully once you've listened to all of it, you'll understand why I had somewhat of a conflict. Now, in order to fully explain this video, it requires revealing a little bit of my future plans. I don't like doing this, one of the tricky things about the way I run YouTube is that there's a sort of storyline that goes on. And when you get to, say, the middle of summer and I'm filming a lot, what I find is that the YouTube storyline and the real world kind of start to slip apart. What does this mean? Well, basically, what you see online that I make actually happened a while ago. So in real time, I'm always ahead of that. It's why you've probably just watched a load of videos over Christmas with nice sunny weather and me talking about the beautiful British countryside and how all the leaves are still on the trees. Now, I've had my Maserati for quite a while, and I've really, really enjoyed it, as evidenced by a recent video, but I've been thinking on and off as to whether there's something better I could replace it with. By and large, I've been trying to think fairly sensible, and there's a certain type of car that I want to try and bring onto the channel from a brand I've never owned before. And whilst I was browsing the classifieds, and to be honest with you, I browse the classifieds regardless of whether I've actually got the desire or the ability to buy a new car, as I'm sure many of us are guilty of, and I saw a spectacular example of a Ferrari FF. The FF, as you well know, is a car that I really, really love. My friend James had one for a short while, and it was an unfortunately very needy car, but the driving experience was superb. It's also an example of a car which is a four-seater that has four real seats in it that you can use, which is still something quite special. And an FF came up for sale that I instantly recognised because it was the old Ferrari press car. So this is the same car you've seen people like Steve Sutcliffe, Harry Metcalf, and many others driving all over the place. Place. That means although it's higher mileage for a lot of its life, it's actually been very well looked after because Ferrari, may not surprise you to hear, take extremely good care of the press cars. Now the car was also for sale at McLaren in the New Forest. It had been taken as part X for something else, presumably a McLaren. In fact, I did find out later it was a McLaren. And the benefit of this is that Meridian Modena, my trusted dealer, are only just down the road. So, I got in touch with McLaren New Forest, started talking about the car. I wasn't really sure whether I could afford it or anything else. I still had the Maserati, and my original plan for what to do next didn't involve selling it at all. But I did some maths and worked out that if I did sell the Maserati, not only could I afford the Ferrari, but the monthly payments, because we've been changing from HP to HP with Balloon, would actually be lower. So I could change my Maserati Quattroporte for a Ferrari FF, and I'd be saving, in payment costs anyway, about £100 a month. So I figured, this is super doable, the FF is a really, really cool car, and although it will be something I'd probably live to regret, what an awesome way to get around over the summer while I work out a slightly more sensible thing to replace the Maserati. So I went and spoke to the people at McLaren New Forest, and I've got to say, I know many of you are probably expecting something of a McLaren bashing video here, but they were lovely. Really, really nice. All of the people that I spoke to down there, really decent, really lovely, and it's for that reason that I felt a little bit bad about making this video. More on that in a little bit. Now, they were very open, and they were very upfront. They said, look, we've only recently got the car in, it does require some prep work. It's going to need new tyres, it's going to need a refurbed alloys, it is due a service and a few other bits. It had a limited amount of paperwork with it, but in that paperwork you could see that the previous owner had spent some money on it. So it was about six or seven thousand pounds worth of receipts that the new owner had spent on the car. They also told me that it had had a new PTU. If you're not familiar with the Ferrari FF, it runs a very complicated system to get its all-wheel drive thing going. So most cars have sort of one gearbox, then they send power all over the place. Ferrari, for various reasons, if you want to know more, watch videos on the FF, have two gearboxes. One at the back, where you'd normally find it in a Ferrari, and another at the front, connected directly to the engine. And that's the PTU, the power transfer unit, and that's what runs the front axle. Those in the FF are known to be reasonably fragile, and they can be very expensive. The cost has come down, but at one point in time, it was about £30,000 to replace those, because they were not deemed a serviceable item. That means if you want to buy into an FF, that's really the big thing. That's your sort of, you know, IMS, RMS, or sort of rob-bearing equivalent. That's the thing that's going to put everybody off buying one of those. However, they told me that had been replaced. We had no proof at all of this, but they said it had been done. 
So I figured, okay, this sounds interesting. They quoted me a price for the car and they said, look, either you can take it as is and it does need cosmetic bits and all sorts done. The interior is a little bit scuffed and there's paint chips and things on the front. You can take the car away and, uh, and, and, and you know, deal with it yourself. And we'll obviously knock a bit more off. Or if you want us to do the prep work, you'll have to pay a little bit more for the car. Fine, not a problem. I agreed to go down there, went and saw them, had a bit of a laugh with them, really nice, decent people. Uh, I took the car over to Meridian for them just to give a quick look at it because what they had done was they'd resprayed the bonnet. I don't know why they resprayed the bonnet because they didn't respray the front bumper or the wings. Uh, there was some corrosion, I think, had started to appear on the bonnet. So for whatever reason, someone decided that needed doing. I wanted to check that the paint job on that was good because it's a Rosso Marinello car. That's one of the triple layer paints, really expensive, very hard to match. Um, and I wanted to see if there was anything we could quickly uh, get looked at um, just to see if the car was you know, worth getting fully inspected. So I drove it. It seemed generally OK, but the new Forest is not a good place to test drive a car. I'm sure a lot of you will uh, have recently watched my Ferrari 360 buying video, which went all horribly wrong. And I know a lot of people wondered in that why we didn't get a pre-purchase inspection of that car. I probably didn't explain very well in that video that uh, both James and myself had recently had experiences of cars from a Ferrari main dealer, from Dick Lovett, which had not only been bought by Ferrari, but inspected by Ferrari and retailed by Ferrari, and both turned out to have quite a few issues. In fact, there was uh, another car that was subsequently inspected, the 599 my friend bought. We did have that inspected by a Ferrari main dealer, and not either of those, and they missed things. So even Dick Lovett's big report, the big £14,000 invoice for the 360, they missed things. And they didn't necessarily miss things through incompetence. They missed things because they just couldn't find everything. As Meridian went through the car, there was more and there was more and there was more. So that's one of the reasons we didn't get a PPI. I didn't explain it very well in that video. We didn't get a PPI because we realised the PPI can still miss things. And to get one of those would have cost probably, once you factor in logistics, transport and all that, six to seven or eight hundred pounds easily. And on a 360, that fixes a lot of problems. By the time you get to something like an FF though, it's a much more complicated, much more expensive car to maintain. So it really becomes an absolute essential. Now I looked over the car, I agreed a price with uh, McLaren. Meridian had taken a very quick look at it. We knew that the front brakes were kind of two thirds of the way done. Rears were pretty much okay. They looked at them, they said, they said, said the discs anyway were okay. Uh, and the paint job, they said actually looked quite good. So um, we said, okay, all right, I'm gonna agree a deal with these guys and it'll be on the basis that the car gets inspected. So went back to uh, McLaren, wanted to do a deal with them. Uh, for some reason, I really cannot fathom why, uh, they were not very keen on the idea of me getting the car inspected. Now, this wasn't because they knew anything. I, of that, I am absolutely certain, and my opinions on McLaren dealers are well known. If I thought there was any sort of foul play from that sort of point going on, absolutely, I would be telling you now. But I don't believe there was. Um, so they were saying, oh, well, you know, we've got other people willing to buy the car, and they don't want an inspection. And I pretty much said to them, like, if you want to sell this car without having an independent inspection done on it, you're absolutely mad. Because I know what FFs are like, it's about the only car that I've spoken to several different Ferrari people about, and they've all said to me, just tread carefully. Every other Ferrari model, generally when I've spoken to them, they said, yeah, no, great, they're lovely cars, well looked after, they'll, they'll, they'll sort you out. But the FF, Ferrari were doing a lot new with that car, and particularly the early ones, they were not perfect. Let's put it that way. Either way, deal was done. Hands were shaken and the inspection was arranged. About a week and a half later, I got the report back. Now, what I was expecting to see, there were a few things, like I mentioned already, that we knew needed doing. Uh, and I was expecting probably two to three thousand pounds worth of work on top, which if that's what they said, it would have been, yep, cool, I'll buy the car. It needed a service, so I was going to get Meridian to service it immediately so I could just use the car worry free. And that was that. However, the report came through and allow me to read you some of the highlights. So first off, uh, parking sensors failed. That we kind of knew because it said that when we got it. Uh, there was a dent in the car. Uh, the ECU on the car had many errors, or 17 different errors logged. But those may have also been not too bad because many were relating to low voltage. The FF is really sensitive to uh, battery voltage. If you have an FF and it's being troublesome, honestly, first thing to check, battery. If it's original, just change it. It's one of these things these cars need. Um, so that may not have been an issue. Uh, the tyre pressure monitoring system, that had an error. The batteries in that were low, so that needs sorting. Wiper blades weren't good. Again, not really a big worry. Front brakes, as we said, they were sort of 62% worn into the number they've quoted here, so th they still had life left in. That's fine. Uh, rears, they were reasonably new, so that's fine. 
The front brake pads, they were okay, but the rears did need doing. They were like 60 odd percent worn and they recommended that they would be done fairly soon. At the instrument cluster service counter, this is a Ferrari Oddity. The Maseratis are exactly the same uh, because they use the same system. Uh, you can only put a certain number of service resets in the car and it reached its limit. So it requires resetting and that's a more involved process than you realize. Uh, there was a rubber missing from the fuel flap. This is a really common Ferrari thing. Uh, all the tires were knackered, but McLaren had told me about that. Then we get to some of the more interesting stuff. Uh, both of the front wheels were cracked. Uh, FFs are kind of known for this, but yeah, both wheels cracked. So suddenly I start to think, uh, okay. Uh, there is some damage to the front bumper. Uh, the near side front shock absorber is leaking and they recommend that these are changed as a pair. Uh, the uh, metal brake pipes to the rear flexi hoses were corroded. The near side rear brake caliper was binding. Uh, there was some uh, play in the bushings of the suspension, and this is a problem because you can't replace the bushes, you have to replace the entire arm on those cars. There was corrosion on one of the doors, uh, the little cooling scoops that are under the car that sort of direct some, uh, they're part of the under tray basically, uh, they are all smashed to pieces, so your airflow into the engine bay is, is compromised. Uh, the steering column was making an unusual noise. I actually noticed that on the test drive. Uh, I thought it was actually a leather on leather thing, but they said, no, it's more likely to be a broken clock spring. Um, the exhaust uh, had an odd rattle, which could have been the valves on their way out. Um, there's some cosmetic issues with the engine, the paint flaking off, but there's also some oil uh, around the side, the, around the camshaft covers. The engine's oil level was also low, low enough for them to note it. Uh, some normal stuff here, sticky switches, uh, stone chips on the windscreen. Uh, one of the seats uh, had its uh, ventilation not working. Uh, one of the seats had its heating stuck on. The rear under tray, they actually couldn't remove because all of the bolts were seized in place. Uh, the vehicle needed a service, which we knew. Um, and there were other bits they said that they would check, but they couldn't because to do that would be sort of, you know, quite invasive. And as it wasn't my car, there's only a limited amount uh, they really want to do. Now, as you might imagine, this is a fairly extensive list. Uh, to put the car right, you'd be looking at sort of 15 to 25,000 pounds, depending on the level of right that you wanted and how much of the cosmetic stuff you needed to sort it. And that is, again, that's the list from a quick inspection. I say quick, they take hours to do this, but that's the list from a full inspection and there's stuff they haven't even been able to look at. Uh, the gearbox, they said, seemed okay, but without being able to take the rear under tray off, they aren't able to properly inspect it. So that wasn't really a point of concern, but it's definitely something you want checked because if the gearboxes go and it's not impossible, they're also, as you might think, an expensive item. Now, after the inspection was done, uh, McLaren phone said, oh, cool, what's going on? I told them and they then said, oh, so do you want to, uh, do you want to buy the car still? Uh, and I said, well, not for the price that we agreed because you'd already told me about some of the items that this picked up that, that I knew about. But there's also a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know about. And once you start replacing alloy wheels, once you start replacing brake pads, you start replacing shock absorbers and things like that, under trays, all sorts of stuff, the price of this car is all of a sudden going up, 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 up. And as it is a 60,000 mile FF, there's only a limited amount it's ever going to be worth. So I made an offer to them and I essentially said, okay, we know roughly what this is all gonna cost. I'll take that off what I'm gonna offer you and that way I'm kind of where I was and that's the car done. They had a think about it, came back to me and said, you know what, we've had to think about it. And the fact is they still have to warranty the car and everything else, regardless of the condition that it's in. Um, we can't sell this car. We're not going to sell this car to anybody. We definitely aren't going to sell it to you, Mr. McLaren hater. They didn't say that, by the way. They were lovely, as previously mentioned. So I said, OK. But then I start thinking, well, what happens with this car? Because this is the situation, this is the exact situation, timing's slightly different between this and the 360. Here's a car that people either didn't know or didn't realize or didn't want to disclose was in pretty poor condition. I should also point out at this point in time that I later found a thread on piston heads about the car, which is well worth reading if you like this sort of stuff, the sort of you know car history type stuff. I'll be doing a video about car history soon as well. And uh, the previous owner had indeed bought it from a specialist and had been told that, you know, the car was absolutely fine and good. And, well, they wound up getting stung for seven grand and the PTU had been replaced because the car then got a Ferrari warranty on it. So he'd already spent or had spent best part of probably £30,000 on the car. I had no reason to believe that any of this stuff would need doing and Meridian are not in the business of making stuff up because if anything they should tell me the car's great because I'll buy it and take it to them. So there's nothing suspect going on from anyone involved here. But here's the dilemma. You've now got this car 
that is knackered, for lack of a better word, and the company that have bought it know that it's now worth so little, it's just a, a risk to them, and it's in such bad condition, they cannot retail it. So they said, okay, we'll send it to auction. And this is where it gets complicated. This is where it gets really complicated. Because I said to them, I said, okay, you, that's fine. You send the car to auction, that's fine. I'm not going to be your problem. But I'll make one demand of you. You now know what the state of this car is. So as long as the car goes to auction with an honest and accurate description of what it is, I'm not your problem. I don't care. Contrary to popular belief, I do not particularly enjoy making McLaren bashing videos. I want the company and the dealers to do really, really well, even if they don't. But I said that. I said, you, you've got to make sure that it's done honestly. And they said, yes, we will do everything we can to make sure this you know, if this doesn't happen because I don't want someone else getting stung on this car, not knowing at all what's going to happen. I then found out that this car is due to go up for auction in a few days' time. For the avoidance of doubt, that's going to be, I think, the 3rd of February 2022. It's going up at BCA Auctions. And this is why I wanted to make this video. This is the meaty bit, okay? Now, BCA, British Car Auctions, they're a huge company which could easily be the subject of their very own video. If you want to know why, probably Google some stuff about them. But BCA, not a company that I particularly like, or anyone else for that matter, and they single-handedly exert far more influence over the British used car market than any one company really should. In any case, they are a very, very popular place to send cars. And you have to think that most cars going to auction are going to auction for a particular reason. It just so happens that in this case, I know exactly why the car is going to auction. So I took it upon myself to try and find out what happens to a car when it goes to one of these auctions. The first thing you have to know about this auction is that it's for dealers. It's for car traders. It is not an auction for the general public. This is one of the reasons I had sort of two minds about whether to make this video, because I can say without a shadow of a doubt that McLaren New Forest haven't just punted it out to collecting cars or somewhere like that for some poor unsuspecting bugger to go and buy it, not knowing what they've let themselves in for. They've not done that. But what they've done instead is sent it to BCA, which in some ways is even worse. On the one hand, BCA is perfect for exactly this kind of car, the sort of stuff that you simply can not sell anywhere else. However, it does create a rather unique environment. What do I mean by that? Well, the best thing to do is to show you what it is that someone would actually see if you were a trader and you were going to buy on BCA. Now, it just so happens that because of what I do, I have motor trade insurance, which is one of the requirements for getting a BCA account. So I was able to do a little bit of amateur sleuthing, sign myself up for a BCA account, which means I can show you exactly what people are looking for. Now, the first thing I saw, which was actually shared on Piston Heads, was this, which is a very basic description of the car, what it is. And this is kind of what you see in advance of an auction. You'll notice there's a little bit saying appraisal due. And what that means is the car hasn't yet been inspected and given a grade. Although the actual numbering system varies from region to region, the whole purpose of an auction grade is the same all over the world. It's a rough guide as to the kind of condition the car is in if you're bidding, particularly helpful if, like most traders, you're probably going to be bidding remotely and won't have seen the physical car until you've already purchased it. Now, it took a couple of days, but eventually BCA did do their own appraisal. And I should point out again, this is not something McLaren have done. This is BCA's own independent analysis of this car. Here's what it looks like. And as you can probably tell, it is exclusively a cosmetic thing. One thing in particular did make me laugh, which is the fact they said that it's got half leather trim. That's underselling the car a little bit because this particular car is kitted out with 13 thousand pounds worth of extra semi aniline leather absolutely spectacular wonderful car and this is not exactly a pub with the right money spent on it at the right people this is still going to be an excellent car for somebody to use and enjoy however nobody bidding on this car unless they've watched this video is going to have any idea whatsoever what is lying in wait for them. All they know is that the paint needs doing, some of the interior is scuffed, and there's a small tear in the dashboard, a couple of dents in the door. That's 
it. That's all they're going to know, except you know, I know, and the people who gave this to BCA all know that car's hiding 20 grand, potentially, of problems. Even if my estimate is double what it's actually going to be, that's still £10,000 worth of problems. Now, some of you may be wondering if the McLaren dealer already knew about some of these issues and simply chose not to disclose them. Well, I'm going to take the opinion now that if that did happen, the sales staff weren't really that involved. The one thing I did take issue with was that when I sent them the inspection report back, they tried to fight me on a couple of things. One saying that shock absorbers should always leak because that's what McLaren ones do. And they also thought I was expecting them to have dropped the engine and gearbox and stuff like that, which I absolutely didn't. What I was upset about was the fact that the rear under tray was seized on, which meant that McLaren themselves couldn't possibly have done a proper inspection of the car because they couldn't have got all the pieces off, nor do they have the correct diagnostics equipment for a Ferrari, and it surprised me greatly that McLaren didn't think for the sum of a few hundred pounds, not a lot when the asking price of the car is 88 grand, that they could have just run it through Meridian's workshop themselves. That would have been the sensible thing to do. This is why I was so confused they were trying to fight me on getting the inspection done at all, because to me it just seemed like a sensible thing to do. And even if the car, say, only needed five grand's worth of work, and I then turned around and said, you know what, lads, I'm going to leave it. It's not for me. They'd then have an absolute concrete cast iron proof of the exact condition the car was in, saving them maybe time and hassle for the next buyer. But that's by the by. What's of interest to me, though, is the fact that BCA have clearly built themselves this little sort of, I don't even know what you'd call it, really. It's not a scam because it's, I just don't think it is. Um, but I don't think it's entirely far off. The reason I feel McLaren really can't be held responsible here is because unless I'm missing something really obvious, and if you're in the trade and you use the system, please tell me if I am, there doesn't really appear to be any obvious way of the dealer or the seller of the car communicating the genuine condition and report. And as it happens, BCA are the kind of company that even if McLaren had sent the car over with the inspection nailed to the side of it, I expect they would have looked at it, taken it off and fed it to the shredder. This, I don't like this. Now, this is car dealers screwing car dealers. That's what it is. Like I said, I don't particularly hold McLaren that responsible, but BCA clearly want their money. BCA have got absolutely no interest whatsoever in uh, doing really anything uh, to tell you that the car is, other than cosmetically damaged, uh, a less than perfect car. It's really, really weird. There's nothing on here at all about anything remotely mechanical. They don't even tell me if the engine starts. Now, the car, you may have noticed up here that the car is listed as a grade five. And I'm told that that means it's the worst possible grade that can be given. However, that actually also seems a little bit unfair because cosmetically, the car wasn't that bad. The car was in reasonable condition for the age and mileage of it. It was largely as I would expect a used car to be. Yes, it needed some prep, but I also knew the prep hadn't been done. So that's really a bit odd. I spoke to a few of my uh, car dealer friends or people I know that work at car dealers, and they all said, yeah, look, BCA, it's a bit of the Wild West, really. You always figure that there is something hidden on the cars, and you just hope that you know, you're not really going to get too stung. But the problem is, with an auction like this, and it being a business-to-business -business transaction, the dealer that buys this have got absolutely no comebacks whatsoever. It's, it's a business-to-business -business thing. That, that's, just, that's just how this all works, and that's how auctions work. You buy it, you take it. Doesn't matter what you find afterwards, that's it. Unless someone's really, really done something particularly awful, trying to get anything back or cancelled through BCA, good luck with you. The Copart, I think, is apparently much the same. And so you might think, well, it's a dealer screwing another dealer. That's surely nothing any of us need to really lose any sleep about. And, well, I suppose in some ways you'd be right. But you have to ask yourself this. The dealer that buys this, they're eventually going to find out just what state that car is in. What do you think they're going to do with it next? Because they could do the honourable, the right thing, fix it up, spend what needs spending, sell it, maybe make a couple of quid, maybe make a loss, chalk it up to experience and just move on with their lives and be a decent, good car dealer. They do exist. But they could also get it in, tart it up, put it up for sale, and uh, hope that the next person doesn't realise 
what they've bought. And if they service an MOT the car, nobody would really have any reason to look under it until something either broke or it needed its next service, which I suppose it could theoretically get to. Given how few miles many Ferraris do, there's nothing to say it couldn't get easily till next year before somebody looks at it again. And by then, it's far too late for any comebacks. So it's for those reasons that I feel a little bit conflicted because I don't think McLaren have really done anything to hide the condition of the car. And the moment they found out what condition it was in, they wanted to make sure they could do everything they could to make sure that I was a happy customer and the outcome was the one that I wanted. But equally, there exists within the sort of car dealer world this really bizarre ecosystem which has been deliberately set up to allow everyone to screw everyone else. And it just seems a little bit, well, odd. Just really, really odd. And I love cars. I love cars. I love cars as a, as a positive experience. I think cars can be a really, really good, decent, healthy thing. So I think it's for that reason I always get a little bit of a bee in my bonnet when I see stuff like this happening, because I know ultimately all that's going to happen with this is someone's getting done over. Now, it was nearly me, but I did actually get an inspection on this one. Yes, I did do it. And uh, now exactly what I feared with a 360 is about to happen somebody's going to wind up with this car and hopefully they haven't paid too much for it but now i've made the video the auction is going to be going out very soon hopefully i'm going to be able to release this video uh, on the tuesday before which should give people enough time to find it and i shall put the registration number in the title certainly for the short term anyway so anyone thinking about it can easily find this video and there is a, an attached thread on piston heads i also very much recommend that you read because it's quite enlightening anyway that's enough from me for today Thank you for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.